Hello, people and Wudong fans. We're back with another show. Jonathan and I this time. Sean's busy with family business. And Jonathan and I today are going to be discussing Taiji as a fighting art. We realize that in this day and age, Taiji has again fallen into the idea that it's just a health art. And maybe you can do some meditation with it. But we don't want people to forget that Tai Chi began and is a fighting art. It came about because Yang Lu Chan and his sons became the trainers of the Imperial Guard of the Forbidden City. And that's why we heard of it. That's why we know of it. That's what it was. That's what it is. A fighting art that was relevant to be the art of the Royal Guard of the Chinese Imperial Palace, which we call the Forbidden City. It began with Yang Lu Chan training in Chen family boxing while well, he was their bond servant for 30 years. And then when he left, started adapting and changing and making it softer and making a more continuous movement and making significant changes. And here's the point, inventing the name Tai Chi Twin. There was no Tai Chi Twin before Yang Lu Chan. He came up with the name. Henceforth, most people in Beijing consider Tai Chi Chuan began with Yang Lu Chan. We have the legends of Wudang Mountain, and we have the Chen people claiming to be the origin because that was his base art. They sort of have a point there. The thing that he based it all on and modified was their Chen family boxing, but there was nothing called Taiji Chuan until. Yang Lu Chan, and we've kind of gone into this um, Chen family and Wudang Mountain thing in our Tai Chi episode. It was strictly overall basic Tai Chi. And we also went into the Wudang thing when we went into our Wudang Mountain episode. So I've sort of covered those. What we want to do today is talk about Tai Chi as a fighting art. How are you doing, John? You ready for this subject? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing good. Um, I'm actually pretty excited for this topic. So I'll, I'll be, for history, certainly I've got some questions for you as you go along. And uh, well, yeah, let's see how it, how it unfolds. Well, like I said, it sort of begins, although we can backtrack some, but it, with the Chen family was always noted and has a lot of legends about how their village defense force used to defeat the bandits that came to rob them. And there's stories of this Chen guy beating that bandit. And apparently it's a very efficient style. As I said, it just, it wasn't known as Chen style Tai Chi yet until the Yangs invented the name, but it was an efficient style and they had their fighters. But along came Yang Lu Chan and his sons. And what happened was when Yang Lu Chan's first moneyed student, uh, Wu Yusheng took him to Beijing to introduce him to his older brother, the minister. While he was there, Yang got engaged in a number of spear duels and really got a reputation for winning spear duels without killing the people, which was considered an amazing feat. You know, you could win or lose a spear duel, but to do it without killing someone was considered quite amazing. And from that, he got offered the job of training the Imperial Guards of the Forbidden City and that's what he and his sons did for quite a while after that. They were the trainers of the Imperial Guards. And Yang Lu Chan and his second son, Yang Chien Ho, were uh, continued noted for their spear work, or completely their spear work. Their um, oldest son, Yang Ban Ho, was perhaps the best empty hand fighter Tai Chi has ever seen. It's been no one else that I've heard of as noted for using pure Tai Chi technique and winning battles the way that Yang Ban Ho did. And he was kind of the odd duck of the family anyway, because the other guys tended to be short and plain at the best. And Ban Ho is noted for being tall, slender, good looking. You could sort of say um, Yang Lu Chan and Yang Chen Ho were kind of me and Ban Ho was kind of Jonathan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he was really an amazing empty hand fighter. And at first he didn't get much credit from it, which had an effect on him his whole life. When he was 17 or 18, he was challenged by a guy who was a dog boxer 
And the dog boxers of this particular style were noted for they would latch onto your arm or wrist with the power that felt like a dog bite. And then they would drag you to the ground and try to kick you to death. And young, young Banho took on this dog boxer. And when the guy grabbed his wrist, he did ward off. And the story is that the guy flew 10 or 12 feet and landed with bleeding from his nose and his mouth, i.e. something got ruptured inside with the power that threw him away. And then the young teenage boy's friends hoisted him on their shoulders and took him home yelling and screaming and all happy. And they came to the courtyard of their hutong and they're yelling and screaming and they're all happy. And uh, Banho runs into where his father is having a meeting with the, the community elders and runs in and starts yelling about the fact that he won this match. And his father stops him grabs his wrist, holds it up, and points to where his sleeve had gotten torn when he bounced the guy off and said, is this the real Tai Chi? And threw his arm back at him, and they claimed that Ban Ho never bragged about another fight after that, ever. Ever. That was the opening, and after that, he was pretty quiet about his fights. Well, that's certainly uh, a better characteristic for a martial artist anyways, so... <laughs> Less bragging. Frank, do we know uh, when they were training the Imperial Guards, were they training them in empty hand as well as spear technique? Or or do we just know that uh, they were training them in the spear? Well, we don't know for sure, but I would assume they're training them in both. And it probably what was done a lot was you train the empty hand to teach them the foundations of the art and then how you would go about applying those foundations to the spear. Okay. Or the other way around is it could be that they learn the weapons and then they learn some empty hand in case for some reason that their weapon got lost or taken away from them or whatnot, they'd have something to do. But I think it's more likely that you teach them the empty hand to teach them the foundations of the art and then add the weapons, which is kind of like what we do today. Okay. And do we have any idea, like um, what we did in Beijing for Tai Chi Spear, is that pretty much what Tai Chi Spear looks like? Or is that just our particular um, system? Because I know that uh, like when we did uh, Bagua Spear with Liu, it was a much, it was more like a form. Whereas um, the Tai Chi Spear that we did really is, is all about the parry and the thrust. Um, I don't know if you remember at another point, Liu went over, this is the more practical stuff and showed us almost exactly the same stuff that Li Gun Yen showed us. Okay. So that parry and thrust stuff seems to have been the, the foundations of the spear technique in Beijing in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It seemed to be what it was. It was circular blocks, the small circles, the large circles, and that twisting thrust seemed to have been the primary thing that was used. Uh, Banho is also noted for, at one point, a farmer who was supposed to be gigantic and really, really muscular and apparently incredibly strong. He built himself as a man of 10,000 pound strength. And he came to Beijing and immediately started challenging the Yang family. The Yangs think they're so great. And he, was, he would go places where he would set up and offer to fight people, but every time he would open with a big challenge to the Yang family. And Yang Lu Chan was like, I'm not paying attention to this guy. You know, we work in the palace. This guy is some big, dumb farmer. We don't care what he says. Nobody cares what he says. Nobody's going to believe what he says. He's just some big, dumb farmer. We don't need to pay attention to him. And eventually, the thing is, Ban Ho was noted for he had a temper. He's quiet about it, but he had a temper. And eventually the stories got back to him enough that it's peaked his temper. And the story goes that they're working with the guards one day and Ban Ho goes, you know, excuse me, father, I'll be back in a little while. There's something I have to do. And so I was like, yeah, okay. And he goes off and he walks to where this guy is setting up, he gets there as he sets up as the guy's walking around doing his beating his chest and taking his shirt off and showing his muscles and all this stuff. And they Banho just kind of stands there with his arms crossed. And just stands there and doesn't say anything until the guy recognizes him. 
And then the guy recognizes him and starts screaming, finally, one of them has come. Finally, they dare to, to meet me. And yada, yada, yada. Bonho doesn't say anything. And finally, the guy charges at Bonho full blast like he's going to grab him and rip him apart. And Bonho's standing there with his arms crossed. When the guy gets close, he does one of those separate hands kicks and kicks the guy right in the crotch. And the guy falls over. Some people say he fell over unconscious. Some people say he was incapacitated. Some people say he was dead. Whatever. One move. <laughs> Turned around, walks back to the compound. His father's like, did you do it? Yeah, yeah, I did what I had to do. It's okay. And never mentions it to his family. Now, eventually, the word got back to them. But he never said a word. It's just, excuse me, I have to go somewhere. Goes, flattens this guy <laughs> with a one separate hands kick completely. And then comes back and quietly goes back to work with, you know, training the guards with his dad and his brother. But uh, that was that was Bonho. He only lived into his 40s. But the other story of him that I kind of like is when he was getting along, probably in his late 30s, he had his son with him. And apparently his son found this rather dramatic because his son was one of the few members of the family that didn't train seriously in Tai Chi. In fact, as soon as he could and was old enough and had majority, he moved back to the village and became a successful farmer. He didn't want anything to do with this fighting and training things. But I mean, he's like six or seven years old when he's walking down the street with his dad and this young late teens, early twenties guy jumps in front of Bonho and screams out his Shaolin lineage and says he wants to fight. And Bonho says kind of the equivalent of go away, kid, you know, I have time. And the guy attacks him and Bonho moves out of the way. <laughs> and the guy goes flying past him and, he and his son go walking along. He's holding his son's hand the whole time. And the kid runs around and gets in front of him again and starts the same routine. And Bonho's like, and he throws a punch or something, and Bonho deflects it in such a way the guy goes flying past him. And this happens a couple of times, and then Bonho's temper clicks. And the guy's in the middle of his raft at one point. He looks down at his little son and says, now, son, you shall hear the swallows sing. And the guy attacks him. He deflects the attack, uses a sword hand, two fingers, pokes a guy in the throat. The guy makes a sound exactly like a swallow singing and falls over dead. And Bono takes his hand, son, and goes walking down the street. But one would assume that the kid found it rather traumatic because, like I said, as soon as he could, he got out of there and went back to where they came from and, and became a farmer. Do we know anything about the uh, the strike, Frank? I mean, obviously, sword finger we see used in in various Tai Chi, but um, I know there's different classifications of strikes in in different arts, and this is just a a poke to the throat is an obvious strike. But do we know like is there terminology for it? Is it called something like a swallow song or something or anything nope, like that? That's the one story I've heard of it that Bonho told his son he'd hear the swallow sing and hit that guy in such a way he made it sound like a swallow and then fell over dead. But that's pretty much all I know about it. Okay. Now, of course, as we know, Taiji fighting is difficult. And the reason that there aren't that many people that fight with pure Taiji is because it is really difficult. And whereas Shingi and Baguazhang, if you don't have it completely internal and you do some external stuff with it, it'll still work. In fact, you can make it work externally. You can, you know, get tired and lose your internal stuff and start doing it external and it, and it still works. And it has hard aspects, which is why this works. And because of the soft aspects of Tai Chi, you kind of have to do it right to make it work. You have to reach a certain level where you can really do this stuff under pressure which of course, as we know, is completely different than doing something cooperative or doing something just for practice. You have to be able to stay completely relaxed and keep your posture and keep your breathing and do your internal movement and power stuff with the internal power sources and do it all to make it work. When it works, it works fine. And of course, the key to Tai Chi fighting is that whole thing of unbalanced uproot well neutralize unbalance uproot and strike so theoretically for pure tai chi fighting you never start anything because you begin with a neutralization of his attack 
And then in the course of neutralizing his attack, you break his balance. When you break his balance, you break his root. And you don't do any of your attacking until you have done that, till you have neutralized him, unbalanced him, and broken his root, which again becomes a difficult thing to try and do, but very, very effective when people can do it correctly. Uh, I remember we were at a tournament once where actually, I think that the girl, it was a, we were watching a, a two girls fight and one of them was a, a Tai Chi fighter. And actually your comment, I think she actually lost, but your comment on it was that she actually really did a good job of sticking to the Tai Chi, um, to that progression, basically um, always trying to uh, unbalance before striking. So. Yeah, I wish I remembered who that was because she really impressed me. And I think that we saw her win a fight and then lose a fight. Okay, could be. I think I think we, we saw both. But even in, in the losing effort, she was using actual technique, which is pretty rare because it's so difficult to do. And it's the stuff that, you know, Ban Ho could do, the stuff that Chen Ho could do. And... um and the stuff that the Chen family could do. I mean, the Chen family adopted the name Taiji Chuen and became Chen Taiji Chuen after the Yangs invented it and made it famous. But they really had some good people. In particular, there was a guy, Chen Zhao Pei, who was a young master from the village who got a teaching position in Beijing. And he was one of the few guys in the village that was completely literate. So when he got to Beijing, he started writing about uh, Chen style, Chen family style, Taiji Chuan. And he uh, wrote, it was either a small book or a large paper or something, but he wrote this whole thing all about it and also comparing it to the other styles and pointing out what he thought was the deficiencies in the other styles. Now, of course, it didn't go over real big in this 1928, 1928 Beijing. That didn't go over real big. So the other guys started to challenge him. And after a few challenges, somebody said, look, well, why don't, why don't you get this over with and whatnot? So he, taking his friend's advice, he rented the space. He built a Leitai platform, which one would imagine was a traditional fairly high Leitai platform. And he defended it for 17 days. And over the course of the 17 days, he defeated 200 opponents. Wow. One after they said some of them would show up alone, but usually they'd show up in fours or five. One guy, the next guy, the next guy. He defeated 200 opponents over the course of 17 days. And after which, I don't think he had to fight anymore. <laughs> it was, you know, he had made his point. And then he was a, a really well known, famous teacher. There was a good teacher. Students loved him, they loved being around him. And it was the days of, you know, um, the founding of the National and Provincial Academies. Remember, as a matter of fact, 1928 was the first of those big tournaments to find the instructors. And I don't think he was in the tournament, but they knew who he was. And by 1929 and 1930, somewhere in there, they invited him to come and be an instructor at the National Academy in Nanjing. So he told his students, you know, I, I love you guys. And I love teaching you, but this is the National Academy. I, I can't turn them down. And they're like, oh, what do we do? What do we do? And he said, well, you know what? I got a third uncle back in the village who's 10 times better than I am. Now, it's probably being kind or whatnot, but there was no doubt that third uncle was better than he was. And he said, I'll see if I can get third uncle to come and be your teacher. And that's how the famous Chen Faka came to Beijing. It was one of the biggest names. It's funny, he has a bigger name now than Chen Zhao Pei as far as internationally. And he came and he fought some challenge matches. It wasn't anything like 17 days on the platform, but somehow he got some pretty big press for his challenge matches and got a big name and took over his nephew's school and ran the school for, for quite a while. Now, of course, there also came that famous incident where at one point they had organized a huge gathering of all the Taiji masters in Beijing. 
and he he was not invited, and but he heard about it and he walked in, and when he walked in, Wu Tu Nan stood up and said, "You don't do Tai Chi Chuan, you do Chen Family Cannon Fist. You're not supposed to be here. This is just for Tai Chi Chuan instructors. Get out." And he said something to the effect of, "Well, you're right. I'm not too sure of the story, the origins of my art. I just know I do it really well and." And we call it Tai Chi, but uh, and he left. And the Chen people to this day go, well, that can't be a true story. Chen Fa Ka could have wasted Wu Tu Nan easily. And they're right. His fighting skills were way above Wu Tu Nan's fighting skills. Although Wu Tu Nan had skills, I think Chen Fa Ka lived into his 50s tops. Wu Tu Nan is one of the guys that lived to be over 100. But that statement shows that the people making it don't know anything about Chinese culture because it was a cultural thing. As we said, Chen Farka was an uneducated farmer. Wu Tu Nan was a scholar of the minister class. There's no way a farmer is going to attack or even challenge a scholar of the minister class. All you could do is win the fight and get beheaded for winning the fight. I mean, there was no way that anything was going to work out for him by challenging a guy of that social status, which is why when Wu Tu Nan said to leave, he left. Um, his nephew, Chen Zhao Pei, is very, very important, though. When he was done teaching in Nanjing Academy, he went back to Chen Village and discovered that they had stopped training. The young men were not training. And they said they described it as the weapons all had rust on them, which would talk, I would imagine the people and the weapons. And so because he was famous and because of his skill, he got the young men interested, got them into serious, serious training programs and revitalized Chen family Tai Chi for Chen Village. He's the guy that made it happen. And in fact, by the time he died, he left behind four great masters, of which two of them are Chen Zhao Wang and his cousin Chen Jin Lai, who we met. Yep. And then there was the, the other two guys that Tina used to talk about. They weren't Chen's, but were the other two of the four great masters that he left behind. And unfortunately, the old guy lived long enough to be old during the Cultural Revolution. Mm. And apparently around Chen Village was one of those places where the Red Guard kids were worse than they were in the cities, much more vicious, much nasty uh, that they were in there. You know, they, they were farm kids that never had anything. And all of a sudden they could tell the adults what to do and come down on the old masters of everything they'd been taught to study. Because if you taught anything old, that's who they were after. And they gave Chen Zhao Pei a horrible time, horrible time. He was beaten. He was humiliated. You know, he was made to walk around town with a dunce cap on. And they really humiliated him. And, and part of it was that in Beijing, as we know, if you practiced in your hutong courtyard, they left you alone. Well, apparently out there, they knew what you were doing and they would come around and catch you practicing. And he wouldn't stop practicing was the thing. He mm -hmm. practiced every night anyway. And they really, really humiliated him until he took this thing, he took the classical names of the Chen movements and changed them all to political slogans like Great God Pounds a Mortar was all of a sudden Mao Zedong Pounds a Mortar. And he would, as he practiced, scream out these political slogans. And number one, he was saying the right stuff, but number two, they just decided that he was insane. And when he started doing that, they left a crazy old guy alone. And every night he would practice while screaming out these political slogan names of the techniques as he did it. And then what I didn't realize happened, I'd never heard this before till this story, but it really worked for everybody, was eventually towards the end of the Cultural Revolution, Mao gave a speech. It was written up and given everywhere. He said nice things about Tai Chi. And all of a sudden, it was okay to do Tai Chi again. All the Tai Chi guys were left alone, and it was just fine to practice, teach, whatever, Tai Chi, because Mao had said good things about it. But that was, was 
Chen Zhao Pei. And, uh, and then, of course, we have our style, Northern Wu style, which was founded by one of the um, Imperial Guards who trained and worked under the Yang family. And in fact, is founded by the guy whose reputation was he was the best of the Imperial Guards. If they had the one guy that mastered the Peng outward energy and the one guy that mastered the Lu inward energy and Chuenyo mastered the transformation. And Chuenyo was the guy that got the whole system. And that tells us that Chuenyo was a really good, good fighter. He had to be. If he's the number one Imperial Guard, that meant he could really handle himself. And then, of course, when he retired from the Forbidden City, he made his own adaptations, particularly the Oxplow stance, and created the Taiji system that we practice and we go to Beijing to study. Mm. Frank, I'm sure you're going to get into this at some point, but... Um... When you when you reach the point in the discussion where you talk about why Tai Chi has sort of lost its reputation as a fighting art, I'm curious for to hear your thoughts on why Chen style seems to have kept more of a fighting element if it was because of the seclusion of the village or or, or what it was. I, I understand that probably I think I know where the discussion will go and why the direction of history changed for Tai Chi uh, or the reputation at least. But um, I, I, I'm curious in that discussion to to also include why the, the Chen style people seem to have kept a more martial element uh, than a lot of other lineages. Well, apparently when they went out of the village, when these four masters started bringing it to the world, Chen Jia Wang went to Australia. Chen Jin Lai went to Europe. Chen Jia Wang eventually came here. Um, Chen Jia Wang's number one student, uh, Ren Guan Yi, settled in New York. And when they brought it out, they maintained that we are a fighting art. Whereas at the same time, a lot of the Yang and the Wu people were discovering that they made more money pushing it as a health art. And that because the Yang and the Wu styles are a bit more subtle in their techniques than Chen style. Chen style was easier to teach people at least to think that they could fight. Whereas with the Yang and Wu style, it was more, more difficult to teach that aspect of it. And they got a lot of foreign teachers, American and European in particular, who never even learned the fighting aspect. It was all done as the health aspect. And that was a, uh, a uh, problem with Taiji even before it came to the United States. Um, it's so good for health and it has such a reputation for health, particularly Yang and Wu style, that it tended to a lot of times be focused on the health aspects. Whereas Chen style, you know, as we know, like pretty much all of those four masters, by the time they're in there, 60s had uh, like knee replacements and hip replacements and stuff like that. It doesn't really have the health aspects of Yang and Wu to rely on. And so that's a lot of what happened. And But it had happened in China in the early 1950s in Hong Kong in particular. The reigning Tai Chi master was Wu Gong Yi, who was Chen Yo's grandson. And all of a sudden, the newspapers started having this stuff of a lot of editorials. It basically said, why does Taiji Chuan call itself a fighting art? No one has seen anybody fight with it for the last couple of generations. It's something that they teach the old people to stay healthy and live longer. And they should admit it and just say that they're an art to teach old people to stay healthy and live longer because no one has seen anybody fight with it for two generations, and they kept having these editorials, and finally they had a meeting of the Taiji people, and in typical Taiji fashion, instead of picking some young stud that may be there that may know how to fight, they said, Wu Gong Yi, you're the reigning master. You're the oldest, best lineage master here. You have to defend us. 
<laughs> he's like, well, okay. And he was like in his early 50s. Um, I always get confused. It's either 1954 and he was 53 years old, or it's 1953 and he was 54 years old. Okay. It was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be close regardless. <laughs> yeah. And I always get confused as to which it was. But so the newspapers picked their fighting guy, who was a 32 year old, famous, interesting enough, famous throughout the Hong Kong area as a professional basketball player. Okay. <laughs> But he was also a uh, white crane kung fu stylist who did Western boxing. And so they picked him to fight Wu Gung Yi. And of course, they moved the fight to Macau so that the betting could be wide open and no questions as to the legality of the betting. And they, they set up a ring in Macau. And unfortunately, there are films of this fight because it ended up being really sloppy like fights tend to be. I don't think either of these guys were particularly regular fighters. They were trained and they were trained to fight and they're both really game. And, you know, one guy 20 years older than the other guy. But uh, they went at it and mostly Wu Gung Yi is either attacking with what, what looks like the setup for part of the wild horse's mane where he's chopping down okay. and then doing it again. And occasionally throwing a Tai Chi punch and the white crane boxing guys trying to move around and box a pit. But actually the old Tai Chi guy is kind of pressing him most of the time. Or when he comes in, the Tai Chi guy slides out of the way and does okay. And, but it's fairly, fairly even going until I think it was the second round, maybe in the first round, but towards the end of the second round, the old guy lands one square in the guy's nose, a really good shot, and probably busted his nose all to pieces. So they're sitting, the young guy's sitting in the corner, and he is not just bleeding from his nose. He appears to be hemorrhaging from his nose, and they can't get it stopped. I mean, they gave him, it wasn't just a minute. They gave him all the time they wanted. Wu Gung Yi didn't care. He'd just soon take the rest. You know, he's in his 50s and not that used to fighting. The rest is fine with him. And they can't get it stopped, and they can't get it stopped. But the young guy's sitting in the corner screaming that he wants to fight. And they don't want to send him out with blood pouring out of his nose. But at the same time, he's screaming that he can still fight. So the betters are going to go nuts if they stop it while he's screaming while he can still fight. And there's going to be, you know, probably bloodshed over the bets. So they go to Wu Gung Yi and say, look, this is the situation. What's going on? Can we call it a draw? And Wu Gung Ying's like, sure. I was just supposed to show that old Tai Chi guys can fight. And I think I've done that. So a draw is fine with me. So they called it a draw, and which canceled all the bets. So no one could argue about it. No money passed hands, period, on a draw. And that was, was the big Tai Chi fight of the early 1950s. Actually, our lineage, Chuen Yo's son, uh, uh, Wu Jen Chuen's oldest son, Wu Gong Yi, when he was in his 50s, had to make this stand, getting back to where we started, because they were claiming that Tai Chi was just for health and shouldn't call itself a fighting art anymore. They should just call themselves a uh, health art, specifically a health art for older people. Hmm. And he, as much as it's a sloppy fight, he still made the point that an old Tai Chi guy could fight and that most guys that age weren't going to be able to fight at all, period. So it worked out. And that's, that's our lineage. That's, I'm pretty happy with that. And then you have the guys that don't use Tai Chi technique directly, but are Tai Chi practitioners who adapt the principles of Tai Chi to whatever the sport fighting that they're doing is. And they've become more prolific than um, the guys that fight actually. And quite frankly, I haven't seen any Chen stylist in any of these, you know, in the Chinese martial arts in New York, I talked about that they had these full contact tournaments Okay. Going on for about 20 years and maybe over 20 years, actually more like 30 years by the time we were getting there. And 
the Taiji fighters in that were Yang or Wu style fighters. And Chen style people, I don't remember ever seeing a Chen stylist in one of those fights. And of course, a lot of it in New York came from William Chen, who was um, Cheng Min Cheng's top young student. He was brought to Cheng Min Cheng. He was a kid who loved Kung Fu movies. And his father said, well, I happen to know a guy who's a real master and probably to his chagrin because he wasn't what he saw in the movies. But his father took him to train with Cheng Min Cheng. This and he was in Taiwan, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, by the time he was in his late teens, 18, 19, they were already calling him young master. And Cheng Min Cheng was using him for you know, he had more work than he could handle. So somebody would hire the Cheng Min Cheng school to run a Tai Chi program at their factory at lunch or after, you know, so that their workers would be healthier. And he would have William go and teach those classes. So William was already an instructor for the Cheng Min Cheng school. But of course, William liked the Kung Fu movies. So he started adapting all of his Tai Chi principles to fighting. And he actually fought in two or three or four of the Southeast Asian fights in the 50s and early 60s when they were kind of really blood and guts fights. And at one of them, he won. One of them, he won his division. I think it's a lightweight division. But he was noted as really, really good Tai Chi fighter. Like, and then, So when he came here, he has always taught his style of I think professionally he was C.K. Chu, but he was Cecil. Um, opened up a school on 43rd Street, 46th Street, maybe 43rd Street and 6th Avenue. And uh, was there for years. And of course, as William's student, he taught William's Tai Chi boxing. And he had people compete in these tournaments also. In fact, uh, Kate's first teacher up in Westchester, Domingo Cologne, was a Cecil Chu guy. And I've seen him fight in these tournaments also. And then, of course, eventually along came us when David Ross, the uh, Lama Pai kickboxing guy, talks about internals and how he only saw three schools of Tai Chi that ever competed in this stuff. And, and then he'll say Williams and Cecil's and ours. But uh, it's isn't as well you know you trained with me it's not direct tai chi fighting it's taking all the tai chi principles and applying it to whatever style the tournament is and then of course william's son max turned out to be a really really good fight so did his daughter for that matter tiffany tiffany fought also but max was really really good uh, Max impressed me the most in the fight that he actually lost, but I was impressed because he didn't show up as a fighter. You talk about last minute fighting. I watched this. Max was sitting in the front row as a spectator. When I watched a promoter come out and obviously somebody had, had dropped out of the, the show and they had somebody wanted to fight. He comes out, he talks to Max. Max goes in the dressing room and about a half hour later, it comes out, changed up, ready to fight. <laughs> Talk about no training, no warm up. He was sitting there as a spectator. And then they had him come out to fight. And he lost a really, really close decision. That uh but right off the blue. And I've also seen him fight and you know, knock people cold with punches and kicks and he's really, really good fighter, second generation. And William continued to to teach boxing right up into his mid eighties. He was still teaching some boxing classes. Because people, I'm not sure if he's doing it now in his late 80s, but I wouldn't be surprised if he is. And of course, some of our stuff, although um, I did some Yang style, I've always considered ourselves Wu stylists. A lot of what I learned of this stuff came from when my teacher, Jan Lang, and I used to go up to Williams an hour before our class started and one of his kickboxing classes was going. And he would stand in the corner in Universal Post and not move for the hour. And like I said, for a year, we got away with, wow, Look at that. Those guelos are standing in posture for a whole hour. And we got to absorb William's teaching. We weren't 
actually participating, but we got to hear everything he said and see everything his students did. And, and I picked up a fair amount of really good tips in that year also. So it sort of had direct effect on our fighting also. But it is different from classical Tai Chi fighting that Yang Ban Ho was doing or that even um, Wu Gong Yi was doing. Like I said, he was doing stuff you could see out of the form. It's different because that's difficult to pull off and you have to do it exactly right if you're going to make it work. But if you can do it right and you can make it work, it's a really, really good fighting art. And the point is that's where Taiji started. Called it boxing, kind of like Chinese boxing. Okay. Not, not necessarily Western. He did teach a lot of hands, a lot of hands. But yes, his people kicked. Like I said, I've seen his son knock a guy cold with a round kick to the temple. Okay. Um, he, he taught, that's boxing as in Chinese boxing. Gotcha. Um, so hopefully you can at least also touch upon the other lineage. Um, now, I don't know the names, but you told me that um, the same lineage ended up going to Malaysia and then having like a very different path for fighting, um, how it developed there. Can you say anything about that? Well, at, at the point in the late 60s that Cheng Min Cheng left for New York, and as I said, he came to New York, and New York was really violent, but the people were really, really tense, really tense, and a lot of problems coming from stress and tension. So when he got here, he started actually focusing on, and he had, had William, you know, 25 blocks away teaching the fighting. But Cheng Min Cheng himself focused on Yang style as a health art, that he really felt the Americans what they needed most was to learn how to get the relaxation and the full body movement and how to do things with the internal principles to improve their health. So that's totally what he focused on the 10, 12 years that he was here. But at the same time that he came to the United States, one of his top students, I wish I knew the guy's name, but I don't, went to Malaysia. And he showed up in Malaysia in the late 60s. There was this thing going on where I'm not sure what precipitated it. Probably some economic something because, you know, the Chinese were probably the shop owners and the business owners and the Malaysians were dirt poor. But for whatever reason, there was heavy, heavy duty anti-Chinese um, racial discrimination going on in Malaysia. And when I say heavy duty, like a Chinese person never knew when some screaming Malaysian was going to come running out of an alley with a machete and try and chop him into little pieces, that kind of discrimination. Right. And so this guy showed up and started teaching Yang style Tai Chi as a fighting art, as a self-defense art, as something that you can use to try and survive when a madman or two or three try and attack you. The exact opposite of what his teacher was teaching in New York. And so in Malaysia, this whole Yang style as a fighting art developed and is still going on to a certain extent, which is interesting in the, the land of Silat where they've got, you know, two or 300 different Silat styles, but still it became, it was effective enough that it became popular in Malaysia. I'm not sure if it's popular beyond the Chinese community, but there's a lot of Chinese there. I mean, Penang's supposed to be something like 80% Chinese. I just but, uh, discussed this with a friend. Not anymore. Oh. They, are no, they are no longer the majority. They are, um, it's still the most Chinese area of Malaysia, but they have not, they are no longer the majority in uh, Penang. Um, and Salat, I think, is um, associated with the Malay and with the uh, Muslim culture. So I, I, I mean, it would not surprise me if um, if people that are interested in, in martial arts in Malaysia, if mostly the Malay would study Salat and the Chinese would study some sort of a Chinese system. I'm sure there's some overlap. I've even heard there's some mixed styles, but um, it would be interesting to, to know more about that. Maybe, um, uh, maybe Nigel has some sort of uh, 
maybe I can look up some discussion from him or something about that because um, it's probably more than just the Tai Chi that developed for fight, like more heavily for self-defense there. It's probably other Chinese martial arts as well, I would imagine, um, since it is a large Chinese community there, they probably had multiple systems. So I would, I would imagine. And I was surprised learning from Nigel and, you know, Jamie studied with Nigel that there are hundreds of different Salat styles that are totally different. I've always thought of Salat as that one with a cross leg, low stances and spinning out of the cross leg stuff and whatnot. But at one point, Nigel was working with the system Jamie was showing me that looks like Wing Chun, but it's yeah. a Salat system. There, there, evidently there are many, many different Salat styles that look really, really different. And maybe they've been influenced by the Chinese. Maybe that's why it looks like Wing Chun or maybe they just discovered it on their own. But there's a lot of different styles. But the point was that Yang style Tai Chi went there and became a fighting art. But the idea is if you learn it, but you got to really learn the principles to do Tai Chi as a fighting art, as Tai Chi. You know, you've, you've got to have your continuous flow of movement. You've got to have your unity of movement. You really, really have to develop the sensitivity. Like, I think it's really important when you're training that kind of stuff to start off with push hands, to develop, which is really just developing the stick root neutralize. As uh, Cheng Min Cheng said, calling it push hands is really a misnomer. It should be called listening hands or sensing hands because the push is really incidental. What you're learning is the defense of stick root neutralize. And it's really important to learn that. And our Wu style has some really re unique variations of that, which as you see when you get into them could be more adaptable to actual fighting techniques than a lot of the other push hand stuff is. But I think it's really important that you have to develop that sensitivity and root that comes from push hands and then go into something like soft hands or our slow sparring where you amp it up a little bit before you actually start to spar. And then to do this stuff where you go from push hands to kind of a row show to kind of a close range slow sparring thing like you've seen myself and Li Gun Yen do in China, our Wu style teacher in China, you see us do that. But I think that kind of training is really, really important. We should really try to get more of it going again with our school. It's just difficult these days because most of it's on Zoom and we don't have that much opportunity for two person, but with what opportunity we do have for two person, I think it'd behoove us to try and do that sort of thing because I think that's a lot of the key to learning to fight with, with Tai Chi to learn that in close sensitivity avoidance with your neutralization, but not at huge range at actually with contact. And I think that's what needs to be done to actually learn to fight with it. And that's why an awful lot of the people just learn it for health. Even some of the ones that think they're learning it for fighting was because you don't get it just from getting the applications. But of, of course, in the West, we have a whole, huge amount of Taiji instructors that don't even know what the applications of their form are for, much as be able to take the applications of the form and apply them to the type of training I was just talking about. And a lot of people that, that what the meanings of the application have been lost. And I'm always happy that within our school, they never have been, or at least know what the applications are for, but you can always use more of that close range sensitivity of adapting the applications to it and learning how to use the applications properly. So I know that you can articulate this uh, better than I can. So I'm just gonna try and get the idea out there and let you elaborate. But um, in a previous conversation, a different podcast, um, I asked you about why people train, what the advantages of training deeper in standing practices is. And it was basically strong legs or muscular endurance. But when Tai Chi is doing all this sensitivity training and deflecting, um, the importance of being able to sink and maintain and um, move in the qua rather than like all these sensitivity things that are happening with your arms 
are all being directed from the center, from the body, and that that sinking in the qua to create space and everything um, is one of the like the foundational things in in Chinese app or in the Tai Chi application, right? Can you say anything about that or? Yes. Well, that comes down to the principles. And of course, standing isn't just strengthening your legs. Standing is where you perfect the four static principles, which is posture, breathing, vision, mindset. And the four of those are developed in standing. And that's where this qua thing, the ability to get a loose qua, is the more you stand, the more you get a little more drop and a little more drop. And the more you learn to separate the dropping of the hips from a bending of the knees, because you have to have them as completely separate things. But developing that posture and developing a lot of the rooting has to do with low breathing. If you're breathing with your intercostal muscles up in your chest, you have absolutely no root. So you have to be able to breathe with your diaphragm and maintain diaphragmatic breathing under pressure. And of course, you first learn the diaphragmatic breathing with your standing. And the soft focus vision is how you get your peripheral vision. That's how you see what's coming and going. And in general, while you stand there, you also know that basically one of the things we do is stand and awaken our nervous system and try to feel the different parts of our body. But that's how you get the sensitivity. So a lot of the basic stuff is developed in the standing. And then when you start into your moving principles, your unity of movement, your continuity of flow, your opening and closing, um, your continuous lengthening, that stuff is done with moving exercises, but there's still slow moving exercises where you feel your body and you train these basic principles into your body, which really has to be done if you're going to make your Taiji fighting classical and work in a classical manner. So it's a matter of developing you know, these nine basic principles, the four static, the four moving. And then, of course, the conceptual principle of yin and yang is also in there because you've got to know when he's yang, you want to balance it by being yin. When he's yin, you want to balance it by being yang. And you want to understand all the ramifications of that simple statement. And so getting these principles are how things work and are necessary to even get the sensitivity stuff that we were talking about. Because if you just do those sensitivity exercises with your arms, they're useless. Right. Yeah, you know, you're just either fooling yourself or just playing a little game that you find is fun. But it has to, everything has to work through the entire body. That's what internal martial arts are about. One part moves, all parts move is not just a statement, it's a reality that makes things happen. And first you get these basic principles so that you can apply them into the sensitivity exercises. So yes, it's really important to have that foundation before, or at least doing it as you're working so that you can integrate it into these sensitivity and movement principles that we're talking about. And then of course also from there is where the power comes, where the weight momentum, the pumping of the bodily fluids, the mind intent from your mindset when you're standing it all comes from the basic principles and then how to put them into the next step up, which is your sensitivity exercises till they gear up into sparring. Um, as you were speaking, I, I kind of want to throw this out there because I thought it was an interesting thing that occurred to me. When you were talking about the yin vision, it just occurred to me that um, uh, in this, similar to your discussion of that, um, blind uh, wrestler that you uh, met in high school. Um, there's this thing of like, we were so much vision focused in general society that um, somebody losing their vision like increases things like sensitivity, uh, what's it called, Pro propriorate? I can't say it, appropriation, the body sense, the, the sense of the um, balance and everything. But I wonder if part of the yin vision thing is uh, proprioception, maybe that's what it's said, uh, the right word. Anyways, that taking the emphasis off of um, focusing with your vision and, and, and doing more of a um, peripherals and a soft vision thing also sort of 
brings up other sensitivity in the body more so like you're not it's um you're not focusing just on uh vision as your as your means of interacting with the world but you're sort of bringing it back to a point where sensitivity in the body becomes uh heightened also yeah where a lot of it goes by feel instead of by see right yeah and johnny was a master of that that's why once he locked up with you you had problems because he could feel he could feel you start to move somewhere before you knew you were even moving it by the way i didn't meet him in high school he's from my neighborhood that was oh, another okay. thing about me being overawed with him when I had to wrestle him that time. I had known him and known his reputation as a wrestler for quite a few years before that because he was from my neighborhood. And okay. so we, knew each, we knew each other from the neighborhood also. But he had that, that sensitivity thing. That was his wrestling thing. He could feel where you were going before you even conceptualized it, which was really, really difficult to deal with. Right. But yes, that's a part of what you have to do with this stuff is you also have to develop. That's why they call it, you know, sensitivity or listening hands. That's exactly what you're supposed to be working on is developing this blind guy level of feeling what the opponent's doing, not just seeing. Because for one thing, let's face it, when you're in a really close, close quarters type of fighting thing in general, there's only so much your vision can do for you anyway. Right. Once you're almost face to face. It, there's only so much you're going to see. You have to be able to, even if it, it's just close range boxing, once you get close enough, you have to be able to kind of do some of it, at least on feel, not on see. And yeah, that is definitely part of what you're doing with these exercises. Well, hopefully we've covered Tai Chi fighting, little history, little stories little ideas about the technique and how you go about it. And hopefully people understand that Taiji Chuan is a fighting art, that it can, that it's also a health art. It's really wonderful for your health. It's a health art. Well, it's a fighting art and it can be used as an adaptation for Taoist moving meditation, which we'll do a whole show on at some point as to one of the methods to go about that. But, you know, it's not automatically meditation because you're doing Tai Chi. You have to be able to do Tai Chi and meditate. But like I said, we'll do a show on that. But the idea is the foundations of Tai Chi and where it came from and where it should actually maintain to get the, even to get the full health benefits, that you get more health benefits out of knowing how it operates as a fighting art than you do when you're just trying to do it as a health art. Not to say that doing it as a health art isn't very effective and worthwhile and good for people who aren't interested in the fighting. But hopefully we've made that point for people. And hopefully we'll see you all next time. As we've learned, we can't say what that is because we don't know what order these things drop and we record them. And then Sean and I sort of figure out what order we should put them in and what goes where. So I have no idea when you will be hearing this. But hopefully, whenever you do, you'll enjoy it. And Sean will have notes as to the school and the books and the instructional visual stuff. And and don't forget our documentary on Amazon Prime. If you haven't seen it, see it. Tina did an amazing, amazing job. It's simply called Tai Chi Club. And it's available on Amazon Prime. And we'll be happy to uh, have you listen to us next time. Be well, enjoy, be safe. Take care, John. Thanks, Frank. Take care.